all of you chirpers out there. Thank you for joining another virtual bird talk with Chirp Nature Centers. This is our third year of holding educational wild bird related events, and we're so glad that you could join us virtually. These events run from May through October. They include virtual bird walks, in-person bird walks. We have our in-person events, as well as our virtual bird talks, which you're joining right now. <laughs> and all of these virtual events can be enjoyed anytime on your YouTube channel. All right, so I wanna go through a few birdhouse rules before we begin our event today. If you have any questions or comments, please post them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you guys. We're gonna have a question and answer session at the end. If we don't get your questions, we'll be sure to answer them later. So thank you guys so much for acting and engaging. We love sharing our passion for wild birds with you as well. Speaking of passion, I wanna introduce you to our bird host for today. He is our woodpecker specialist and his name is Matthew Schreiner. He actually started birding in 1992, almost 30 years ago. So he has a lot of experience under his belt. He has done multiple field research projects. He's worked with Fish and Wildlife and Big Bear on the Migratory Avian Productivity and Survival Project. He was working on that for three years. He's also done bird banding and he presented at the Western Bird Banners Association on the Nat Catcher in the 1990s. He also is very active on eBird and participates in citizen science constantly. He has 463 life list species, pretty impressive. And he'll talk about a few of them today. He also was our team leader on Chirp's first global big day bird count. He took us to locations all over the Big Bear Valley and we were able to count a ton of birds. It was so much fun and we were so grateful for his help throughout the entire process. And in all of his free time, he's also a daytime baker. He's a vice president and he's the product implementation manager for deposits and online and mobile. So as you can see, well qualified, a ton of knowledge. Matthew, I'm so excited to get to work with you today. If you want to go ahead and show the audience. Hi, thanks for joining Hello. us. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, what was your birding aha moment like a moment where you saw a special species or you just really i don't know connected with nature in such a unique way well i'll tell you uh you know over 30 years there's been a lot of of just incredible moments um i i typically travel with a pair of travel binoculars uh i you know one of them uh the moments that was just absolutely amazing for me uh i was on vacation in new zealand and was in a kayak and uh, was just kind of paddling along and a little blue penguin was swimming in the water next to us. Um, wow, that is something that, you know, I honestly did not expect uh, to see or experience. And uh, it was just absolutely a fantastic moment uh, kind of in my, in my birding career. Um, and, and, you know, there's the flip side where uh, I go on vacation and I specifically look for a species and uh, up in Glacier National Park up in Montana, uh, the harlequin ducks are up there. Uh, they are a rapid uh, river kind of flow duck, um, not generally seen uh, except in the backcountry. So I uh, put my scope on my back uh, in a backpack and went tromping off probably five or six miles, uh, found this place where they had been recorded being seen in the past. And sure enough, there was a whole family sitting uh, out on a rock right in the middle of this roaring river. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. And it's one of those things when you go new places and um, you really get to see and understand them in their natural habitat. Uh, so many birds pass by us uh, and are just moving either north or south. And we don't really get to see them in big numbers. We don't get to see them kind of in their natural habitat. And so uh, for me, that's super special and, and super exciting. Uh, to be able to see these birds, you know, just living life like they're supposed to be, which is really cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, all right. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm sure everyone else is as well. So go ahead and share your screen and let's learn about some of these woodpeckers and what makes them so wacky. All right. Fantastic. Well, we're going to go ahead and share. Gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Perfect. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm super excited. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go through today and, and talk about some unique features of woodpeckers. Um, I'm sure you all have field guides in your home. Um, as you can see, I have a few behind me here. Uh, it's a majority of my bookcase. 
Uh, and so we're really not going to be uh, talking about all of necessarily the field markings of the birds today. Um, I, I purposefully went to look for some unique things uh, that uh, you may not be aware of. So uh, as we go through today, I will mention and point out some, uh, some plumage differences. So uh, things that are unique about some of the birds, uh, but I'm not gonna go through their exact size and where they fit and all of those things. Um, and I would encourage you, if you don't have a field guide, uh, you know, you can obviously get one from Chirp. Um, you can get one from Amazon. You can download one on your cell phone. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, different avenues that you can get some of that basic information. So I thought I would start today by, you know, when everybody says woodpeckers, there's kind of one famous woodpecker that comes to mind. And you got it, it's Woody Woodpecker. Uh, and this story was told to me years ago, and uh, I, I, I actually had to go back out and get the exact story around it. But um, so the, the artist that is responsible for Woody Woodpecker, uh, Walter Lance, um, was on his honeymoon in June Lake. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar with where June Lake is, um, it is on the eastern side of the Sierras, uh, about uh, probably about five hours north of Southern California. So on the 395, it's a beautiful like alpine lake. It's, it's the water's crystal clear. Um, there's a lot of oak trees around June Lake. Um, and hence, we have a lot of uh, woodpeckers because oak trees and the acorns attract the acorn woodpecker. Um, well, uh, you know, these acorn woodpeckers, if I'm sure if you have them in your yard, you'll know. Um, they're very noisy, they're, they're very active, and there's usually quite a few of them together. It's not the one-off woodpecker uh, that you normally would see. So, uh, you know, these birds were keeping them up, and uh, during the night it started to rain, and they realized that these woodpeckers had poked so many holes in this cabin that they were staying in that the water was coming in as well. And uh, so, the story goes that uh, he used the acorn woodpecker as the inspiration uh, for Woody Woodpecker. Now, of course, this is kind of the classic Woody Woodpecker uh, image that I'm sharing right now. Um, and I'm going to share what an acorn woodpecker looks like and what a peleated woodpecker looks like. So this is the acorn woodpecker on the right. Um, this is uh, the bird that you will see squawking from tree to tree. Um, but as you will notice, kind of Woody doesn't look like him. Uh, Woody looks more like a peleated woodpecker. Um, and the one thing I'll say is um, if you've never seen a peleated, and if you look it up in the bird guide, I mean, a peleated's like a foot and a half tall. These are really big woodpeckers. Um, and so uh, the, the, the theory is that he used a little bit of creative license when he did Woody Woodpecker. He had an inspiration, but um, I don't know. I, I think it may be a little bit of fraud because, you know, if you really look at the two, other than the characteristics, we're really not seeing uh, a lot of uh, similarities. Uh, but I did want to play uh, their song for you real quick. And um, created Woodpecker you'll notice uh, the peleated is more like Woody Woodpecker, the quick rapid beat kind of song. Whereas uh, the acorn woodpecker, so if you're in the Big Bear area or if you're anywhere near uh, an area that has um, uh, oak trees, you're going to, this sound is going to be very familiar to you. Uh, these guys get up at the crack of dawn. They are up as soon as that sun starts to peek over um, and they're up all day and boy, do they make a racket. Uh, but they're super cool and they're super pretty. Um, so I'm really excited. Pileated woodpecker. All right. So we're going to, we're going to just go through a, a, a couple of, uh, interesting facts and pieces about woodpeckers before we really get to get into it and understand what we have in our area and, and what are some really unique um, uh, birds that you can see out in the field. So, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, 
you know, woodpeckers are pecking on wood all day. And um, geez, if we did that, we would have a splitting headache probably after like two minutes. Uh, but woodpeckers don't. Um, they have adapted um, that they have really strong neck muscles um, and it allows them, uh, if you also look at their bills as we go through, they have very sharp bills. So they're using their neck muscles in combination with their bills and they're chipping away um, at the bark of the trees. Um, and as you'll see, as we get a little bit later on, the, the sap suckers, which are part of the woodpecker family, um, have very similar bills as well. Um, so it's kind of a, a really cool thing that um, they've been able to adapt and have modification um, that they can peck on those trees all day and not have any issues or uh, damage to their bodies. Now, it is super cool. <laughs> Um, so the other thing is um, woodpeckers have really long tongues um, and you really don't think about that to be honest with you um, because if they're pecking in they're probably looking for the insects right well they have to have a long tongue because that bill is quite long um, and so the tongue actually rests between the skin and the skull when it is retracted so when their tongue is inside it is adapted so that it can go up in between the skin and the skull, and that's where it rests, um, which is kind of bizarre. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of goes with one of those like, uh, you know, uh, 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 lizards that have the tongues that go out and come back a chameleon or something. And isn't, I thought it was interesting, don't hummingbirds have a similar they also have a crazy long tongue as well. They do, yeah, absolutely. So hummingbirds, their their tongue almost extends, depending on the species, uh, like be a, another length beyond what their bill is itself. Um, and that's adapted so that they can get to all of that sugar and nectar um, in each of the flowers. Um, so it's, it's really cool how nature has been able to adapt all of these different species uh, in order for them to be able to survive. Yeah. Now you'll notice um, also on woodpeckers that they have two uh, uh, toes that go forward and one that goes back. So it allows them to grab onto the bark and stabilize themselves. Now, if you've ever watched, um, not all uh, woodpeckers uh, migrate trees or go in the same process, but you'll notice that they will actually put pressure uh, on their back tail feathers as kind of a, a pivot to help them go up the tree. Um, and if you ha ever have the opportunity to actually see one of the uh, tail feathers of a, uh, of a woodpecker, it is really stiff. It's not really soft and flowy um, like their flight feathers um, or their body feathers. It is really stiff. And because they're using it all the time to go up and down the trees, um, they get worn out really fast. Um, so they're not all pretty and perfectly edged and all of those things. Um, so it really is kind of a, another one of those weird adaptations that's, that's happened over time um, that's really kind of cool. Um, okay, so when we talk uh, about woodpeckers, the first thing that you think of is kind of that knocking, that drumming that you hear. Um, in a lot of cases, that's probably the first thing that you're going to uh, is going to be the first indication that you have a woodpecker in the area of where you're at. Um, so you're going to hear them um, drilling on a tree or on a building. Um, I will tell you that uh, we have woken up a many of mornings with a woodpecker uh, on our metal chimney uh, at our house and it echoes through the whole house and uh, it is quite the, uh, the uh, you know, excitement at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, but they will drum on things because they don't have uh, a song that they use to uh, court other woodpeckers. So most songbirds or most birds um, have a song that they will sing. Um, and you usually can recognize that song pretty easily as belonging to a specific species. Well, hummingbirds don't sing like that. Um, they uh, use that drumming uh, as their kind of courtship call. Um, and so when they're drumming on whatever that surface is, whether it's the chimney at your house or 
uh, a tree out in the forest, um, they're, they're actually sending kind of that love song to their potential partner, um, which is really kind of cool. So I have a quick question. There's obviously there's the function of drumming, which is different than pecking and drilling to get into the holes, right? So they serve different functions. They do, yeah. And so, um, so typically when you hear, um, when they're just pecking for food, it is a, an occasional type thing. Um, so they'll chip something off, they'll go in and get uh, whatever is behind that, and then they'll move on to the next thing. Whereas drumming is usually uh, a repetition. So you'll hear kind of a, a continuous peck um, or drilling sound. Um, and so that's the drumming part of it. Um, if you just hear like a little kind of peck every now and then, he's probably just looking for some food. <laughs> Now, now woodpeckers, um, can, their, their menu or, or their, their uh, diet consists mostly of insects, berries, nuts, seeds, um, all of the things that can be found in the forest. Um, and so they are going to be working kind of a, a specific territory. Um, and you'll see most or some will be super high up in the trees. Others will be down close to the ground. Um, and I will tell you that if you're out on a hike uh, and you notice that you have a rather large bird kind of pecking around on the ground, it flies up into the tree. It's get a, got a big white spot on the rump just between the lower portions of the, uh, the wings. Um, that is um, a flicker, a northern flicker, um, which is part of the woodpecker family as well. So We'll, um, we'll talk a little bit more about them a little bit later, but they like to be on the ground, whereas you have some other ones that you'll be straining your neck after a long day of birding uh, because you've been staring up so much uh, throughout the day. Um, now, uh, woodpeckers uh, drill for holes for a variety of reasons. Um, so they will actually create a nest hole. Um, so if you see a hole in a dead tree stump or um, some kind of, um, of wooden structure uh, that's probably been created by a woodpecker. Um, and a lot of other birds use former woodpecker holes as their nest because they don't have the ability to dig in that tree themselves to create that nest. So things like mountain bluebirds or uh, western bluebirds, they don't, if you notice, they have a very small bill it's very pointy, but it's really designed to catch insects. It's really not meant to drill through uh, through wood. And so you kind of have this uh, environment where they, as woodpeckers move from year to year and they use a different nest hole, somebody else will actually come and use that previous year's nest hole. Um, a little secret, if you see a hole in a tree and you're like, I wonder if something's nesting in that, um, if you look at the bottom of the hole, um, does it look like it's been recently disturbed? And what I mean by that is, is it discolored a little bit from the bird going in and out of the nest? So they use their feet, they may be standing on that lower lip, um, and you can see like a little worn mark. Uh, so, um, you know, if you touch something a lot of times, you'll notice that, that it builds up or um, you can tell that it's been worn. And the same thing with uh, woodpecker holes. Um, and so that's a great indication that that is an active nest, that birds will probably be coming in and out. And um, if you ever see them together, you'll right away notice that um, that worn pattern um, is a great indication. Oh, that's interesting. And just a reminder for everyone who's watching, if you guys have questions during the presentation, go ahead and post them in the chat because Matthew has all the answers. So. <laughs> And if I don't, I'll figure it out for you. Perfect. There you go. Even better answer. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to start and, and talk about some of those more common species that we would find in the Big Bear Valley um, and in Southern California in general, because a lot of these birds are not just specific to Big Bear, um, but you can find them over a larger swath of, of Southern California or California in general. Um, so we're going to start with the acorn woodpecker. Uh, once again, this is kind of the uh, inspiration for Woody Woodpecker. Um, they are very loud. Uh, they 
um, are they're usually in a family group. Um, and so the information I'm going to share about Acorn um, is a little different than some of the others in the fact that um, the nestlings, so the acorn woodpeckers will nest, they'll hatch the eggs, those young will actually stay with the parents in this kind of extended family, um, and they will help raise the next set of young um, that come along. Um, and so they start to build these family groups, and then as the family group gets too large, um, they'll, they'll parse off after a few years and start their own family group. Um, but that's generally why you hear and see so many of them together. Um, I will say that um, it's not uncommon for a dead snag on a hike to probably have four or five acorn woodpeckers sitting at the top, squawking back and forth to each other. Uh, and um, they're just very, very social birds, um, which are super cool. Now, Acorn woodpeckers uh, do rely on acorns. That's why they have the, the name acorn woodpecker. Um, and so they actually spend a lot of time collecting acorns. Um, and you know that the stat that uh, I think uh, Tori, you shared, and um, I'm gonna share again, is that you, know, you could have up to 50,000 holes in a single tree pole, uh, whatever it is, um, just from one set of, of acorn woodpeckers. So 50,000 holes. And I told Tori earlier when we were talking about this, I'm glad I wasn't the person that had to count all 50,000 holes. Um, that seems like a lot of work. Uh, but super, you know, super exciting because you really do know when there's an acorn woodpecker around. Um, you'll see those granaries, um, pretty common. Um, and um, they don't eat the acorns all year. And what you're gonna, I think, find as a common piece um, across all of the birds that we're talking today um, is they will naturally go for insects, ants, grubs, um, larvae of other things. Those will kind of be the, the first choice. Um, and then they'll move into sap, acorns, um, you know, things, uh, seeds um, that may not be um, as, uh, dependent on the seasons because we definitely have a season when we have more bugs um, and so the birds will actually go and eat those bugs before they eat the seeds because the seeds probably aren't going to go anywhere acorn woodpecker all right so our next bird that we're going to our next woodpecker we're going to talk about is the lewis's woodpecker um and uh if you are a, a fan of uh of some of the birding journals and pieces like that, you'll notice that in the latest edition of Birdwatching Magazine, um, they actually have highlighted the Lewis's woodpecker uh, because it was first discovered in 1805 um, uh, with the Lewis and Clark Exposition um, as they moved west. Um, the, first, uh, the first bird was uh, collected in Montana um, and that's when it got its name of uh, Lewis's woodpecker. Now, these birds um, are very beautiful and they are very different from a lot of the other woodpeckers that we're going to talk about today. Um, if you notice on the breast, it's kind of a rosy pink color. Um, he's, he or she is green on the back, um, a lot of um, red, pinkish on the head as well. Now, these guys vary a little bit um, from our other uh, woodpeckers in the fact that they fly catch. Um, and what that typically means is that um, if you've ever been walking and you notice that there's a bird sitting kind of at the top or on the edge of a tree, and then they, you see them kind of fly out and look like they're going for something, and then they go right back to that same spot. Well, when they flew out, they were actually going after a flying insect. Um, and uh, so they fly out, they, they fly catch, um, grab whatever's in the air and they, and they typically come back to a specific roost and they have a ton of roost in, in an area. Um, but the Lewis's woodpecker has that same behavior. So it will start as a, a perch somewhere. Um, it'll be watching the area around it. It'll see something flying, they'll fly out, they'll grab it and they'll come back to their tree. So. Um, a little bit different behavior than some of the other uh, woodpeckers that we have that just spend all of their time uh, 
potentially going up and down tree trunks. So I thought we would take just a second to listen to the call of the Lewis's woodpecker. Lewis's woodpecker. Lewis's woodpecker. All right. I love, it. I love hearing it. Oh, okay. Another question would be, so all these birds that you're mentioning, where Chirp is located in Big Bear Lake in California, are you able to see majority of these birds in that area? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Lewis's woodpecker, we, we actually had a sighting uh, last summer. Uh, we were out at Coxie Meadow, um, which is, uh, I guess, kind of on the north side of uh, the San Bernardinos in that area. Uh, we turned the corner and there was a Lewis's woodpecker sitting right in the top of the tree. So um, yeah, most of the birds that we're gonna talk about today, you'll be able to see in the, in the local valley. Um, you'll notice that the song of the Lewis's woodpecker or the call um, was a lot higher pitched, a little bit more songbirdy-like um, than what we're used to uh, with a lot of the other woodpeckers. And I think you'll hear that as we go through uh, the other birds today. All right, well, this is one of my favorites. And um, this is the white-headed woodpecker. Uh, super cool bird. Um, I will tell you that I have a lot of birding friends across the nation. Uh, and uh, we always, uh, if we go visit each other or we're gonna be in the area of where somebody else lives, we always are touching base to say, on my life list, I'm missing this particular bird. And um, I actually had some friends that uh, live in Arizona and they were coming to California. And uh, we're very interested in this white-headed woodpecker because they don't have it in Arizona. Um, and uh, we were able to get it for them. Uh, they were super excited about it because it really is a kind of a super unique bird. They are pretty common in the Big Bear area. Um, I know that we, um, we did have one, um, I, I wanna say on one of our walks uh, mm -hmm. not too long ago. So, um, they, they are, are plentiful in, in the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, they do like uh, the upper elevation. So you're probably not going to see these guys down in the flatlands. Um, so in the valleys, uh, probably you know, under 2000 feet, um, you're not going to have the white-headed woodpecker. Um, but um, these guys, uh, the interesting thing about these guys is they will nest in just about any log that has a hole, uh, whether it is stable Ending vertical, leaning, or even on the ground, um, which is a really cool um, difference than some of the others. Um, and uh, it, it always kind of goes back to a lot of times they're very specific in where they nest. Um, they're very specific in the kind of tree and, and those types of things. And, and these guys seem to be a little bit more well adapted. Um, now the white-headed woodpecker, um, both the male and the female will incubate the eggs. Um, the male does the work at the night, at night, so he will actually be on the nest um, overnight, uh, where the female will be uh, somewhere nearby, uh, probably resting, uh, because uh, they do share on and off, uh, which is a, a little bit different than some of the other uh, woodpeckers we have locally. Um, the great thing about these, they're super easy to identify. Their body is pretty much all black, um, and they have this great white head. So we're gonna take a quick gander of their song. White-headed woodpecker. So this is a, a, a more typical song. Um, so that little bit higher pitched, a little bit more rapid fire. Um, this is a, a definite uh, woodpecker call um, that that you'll hear and and. It'll sound similar to some of the others uh, as we go through. Yeah, I feel like we definitely heard that on our walk. I did have a question from Eddie about yeah. the white headed woodpecker. He said, is there any significance to the eye color, sorry, of the acorn woodpecker? I've noticed that some have red eyes, other have white or bluish. This is the acorn woodpecker specifically. Um, no, so these birds are all daytimes bird, uh, daytime birds. Um, usually the eye color um, or the size of the eye varies by a specific feature. Um, and usually it's usually adapted to the amount of light uh, is typically what is driving them. 
Um, so there isn't really a uh, uh, biological reason that uh, the eye colors would be different um, for function. Um, it, it really is more of a, a species specific thing. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the hairy woodpecker. And the hairy woodpecker is, is also pretty common in the Big Bear area. Um, I know that the, the hairy woodpecker does come down to my feeders in my backyard. Um, and uh, I, I see them quite often. Um, they will pop onto the bird feeder um, and eat some bird seed on occasion. Um, and uh, so the, the hairy woodpecker is very similar to the downy woodpecker. And so we're gonna see that next. Um, I will make a, a couple of um, comments specifically about the size and, and um, specifics to this bird because it is so similar um, to the downy woodpecker. So one of the things that you wanna notice is the size of the bill. Um, you'll notice that his bill is, is probably almost equal in length to the size of the head. So if you measure from the end of the bill to the edge of the back of the head, and then the back of the bill to the beginning of the bill, they're very long. They're very similar in size. Um, and of course, um, this, this bird is, um, is probably about eight inches, maybe nine inches in length. Um, and uh, so you'll typically find them on uh, tree trunks. So they'll work their way up a tree trunk. Um, and uh, you'll notice on the next slide that the downy is a little bit smaller. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the cool facts about the hairy woodpecker, um, they will drink sap leaking, leaking from whales uh, that have been created by the sap suckers. So, um, you know, that old uh, verbiage of, of, well, you know, are they, are they eating the, or drinking the sap? What are they doing? Why is it, why are they poking all of these holes? Um, well, the hairy woodpecker uses it as a, a potential food source. Um, and the great thing is, is the hairies probably aren't the ones that are drilling the holes. They're really looking for uh, all those insects and seeds and stuff. It's the sap suckers that are drilling the hole. And they're a little opportunistic and saying, oh, wait, there's some extra food here. Uh, I'm just gonna take a sip while I'm here. Very resourceful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very adaptive. We're gonna listen uh, real quick to the hairy woodpecker. Hairy woodpecker. So there was that that rapid that rapid call that rapid uh, re repetition in the in the call. Um, once again, very metallic, very high pitched, um, very common. Um, and if you if you listen, um, the the white or yeah the white headed woodpecker was very similar with that very high pitch, very metallic uh, call it in in itself. Harry woodpecker. So now if we look at the downy woodpecker. Um, if you look at this bird, you will notice how small the bill is. Um, on our last one, and we'll pop back over to it. See how large that bill is on that hairy woodpecker? It is sizable and significant. Um, when we look at the downy woodpecker, it is rather small. Uh, it's, if, if you were to measure it, um, it's nowhere near the size of the head of the bird. Um, and the overall size of the downy woodpecker is much smaller as well. It's several inches smaller, but the plumage is very much similar. Uh, and so when you're out in the field and, or even at home, um, it's really hard to say, oh, that bird is six inches, that bird is eight or nine inches, because you don't have a ruler on the side of your tree to say, oh, wait, can you just pop over there and stand two steps lower? Um, so it's really kind of one of those things that you have to start looking at other pieces on the bird to be able to identify them. Um, and so the downy woodpecker, um, the dead giveaway is the size of the bill. Now, of course, it's always easier said than done because they pop around the side of a tree and you're trying to get your binoculars on them and you're following them around a tree. And I think sometimes they're just having fun with us to say, okay, good luck. Um, but uh, they're, they're a beautiful bird. Um, they also will come down to bird feeders. Um, so I have had downy woodpeckers uh, to my house in Sugarloaf um, and they will come down 
one of the uh, kind of uh, features or one of the things that a lot of people will say is the downy woodpeckers will typically go for the smaller branches. Um, so you will see them on some of the auxiliary branches of a tree. Um, whereas the hairy, because they're a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier, they tend to stay towards the larger trunk size uh, limbs of trees. So um, it's kind of a, a fun, uh, you know, little adaptation that they've made. They can both be in the same tree at the same time, but they're eating from different areas, um, which is, you know, a, a great, a great thing. Now the, the downy is smaller, the bill is smaller. Um, and so they actually have the ability to go in and uh, get some of the, the insects and larvae that some of the other birds aren't able to uh, because they're probably having to either chip more off. Uh, so they're trying to get more bark out of the way um, or it's just in a crevice that they can't get to. So the downy kind of has a little bit of a, a game up on them uh, in that particular area. Mm -hmm. So the downy woodpecker, let's downy woodpecker. play their song. Mm -hmm. So once again, the quick, rapid uh, call beats, um, and uh, once again, very metallic-y. So, um, you know, the more you start to specifically identify these birds, um, the more that you'll start to listen to, uh, you know, how often are they repeating certain calls? Um, certain birds will repeat uh, a certain call more frequently than others. Um, and there are actually some bird species that sound exactly the same until like the last call note or two, which varies. And you're like, oh wait, that's not that bird, it's this bird. So, um, you know, it's one of those kind of, uh, the more you do it, the more you understand and the, and the more uh, easy it becomes. Well, just to let you know, Matthew, you have a flood of questions coming in. So it's like five more minutes for sure. presentations, perfect. And then we'll jump into the Q and A session. This is awesome. Thank you so much. I'm learning so much. And post in the chat if you're learning too, because this is fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, so we're gonna hit, I believe, which uh, our last uh, woodpecker, which is the nettles woodpecker. Um, and the nettles um, is also pretty common uh, in the Big Bear area and pretty much throughout Southern California. Um, they are in the oak woodlands, very much like the acorn woodpeckers. Um, the only difference is the nettles don't eat the acorns. Um, that is a specific acorn woodpecker, woodpecker adaptation. Um, these guys will go around um, and just eat the, uh, the insects and, and seeds and those different things. Um, you can see in this particular picture, if you look at the uh, foot, you can see the two forward toes and the one back toe that is um, descriptive of a woodpecker. Um, this guy's a little bit different. So if you've noticed the woodpeckers that we've seen so far, um, the, the downy and the hairy were mostly black. They had a little bit of white flicking uh, along the breast. The white headed was all black. These guys have a striping of white dots across their back. So. Um, if you hear the nettles um, and you go to look to see what it is, you'll notice that um, the coloring is different on this particular bird, um, which makes it a little bit more identifiable, a little bit easier. And so we'll play a quick song. Nuttles Woodpecker. So you noticed on this bird, it has really short repeatable uh, calls, which is a little different than some of the others where they would do a call and then a whole bunch of repetition and then another call. Um, so the nettles is usually pretty easily identified just by its song, um, especially if you're walking through kind of an oak woodlands area. Nettles. Okay. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about sap suckers. Um, and so some people are like, well, are sapsuckers woodpeckers? Like their name is different, but they look kind of the same. So when I see them in a tree or on the side of a tree, I would say that that's probably a woodpecker. And you're right, it, it is a little bit different, but it is a woodpecker. They have uh, a lot of the same characteristics. Um, it's just that they've adapted a little bit differently than uh, the woodpeckers themselves. Um, so they 
the, the first kind of fun fact is um, they don't suck sap. Um, they actually will drill holes, but they actually kind of sip it. So they kind of just lick it off the side uh, once it's kind of dripped down. So um, they're not really sucking the sap, but they are taking advantage of the sap. Um, now, the sap suckers in a lot of cases will go to a little bit softer barked trees um, the, the red-headed sap sucker that we have in the Big Bear area, a lot of times you'll find in the willow trees. Um, and their, their bark is super soft. It's easier for them to get in. And you'll see little rings where um, they've pecked their holes. Now, the sap suckers aren't the only one that like the sugary um, sap of trees. Um, our hummingbirds, which are nectar-based, um, we don't always have blooming flowers. Uh, and so they have to have an alternative besides our feeders, of course. Um, and so you'll find the rufus, the calliope, some of the other hummingbirds will actually watch where the sap suckers are and they'll go take a little uh, taste of the sap as well uh, because it's got the sugar content that they need uh, to survive. So kind of a really cool little fast fact there. All right. So the Williamson sat sucker, uh, which uh, we actually saw on our last bird walk, uh, our last in-person bird walk, uh, uh, Randy was giving his talk and it just happened to pop around a tree uh, right, right beside Randy. And so um, this is a really cool, probably one of our, um, our more rare uh, uh, sap suckers in the, in the Big Bear Valley. Um, you'll notice they look kind of different than everything else that we've seen today. Um, black and white again, but they have this really great uh, yellow belly um, and they have some red up a around the top here. So um, once again, sap suckers, they like the shallow holes um, in the tree. So they're not gonna go for really thick bark trees, generally speaking. Um, and there has been this whole, uh, thrive um, or this whole uh, piece to, to really understand the sapsucker world. Um, and at one point, the three sapsuckers that we're going to talk about today were all considered one species with different variations. So they were subspecies. And as they got into more genetic work, they realized, oh, wait, hey, these are different birds. Um, they are different species. So it was a really cool kind of discovery and and peace. We'll just listen sucker. real quick. So they sound, or this particular one sounds a little bit more to me like the acorn woodpecker. They're a little bit more chatty um, than they are collie. Um, and the one important thing to notice about, or to know about the Williamson sap sucker, this is the male that we're looking at now. Williamson's oh, this is the female. Wow. She doesn't look anything like him. Um, and for, for those of you that may be newer to birding, um, you know, this really could be mistaken for uh, a northern flicker um, or a red shafted flicker. Um, the thing that will differentiate it is its belly actually is yellow. And so mm -hmm. if you were to see the belly of this bird, it's yellow, um, which is a dead giveaway that it's not a, it's not a flicker. So just kind of a really cool thing um, in our, our local uh, birds here. Um, our red-breasted sapsucker, um, this one is pretty common throughout, and you can pretty much see it all over the Big Bear Valley. Um, and uh, they have brilliant red heads, which make them absolutely uh, beautiful to see. Um, they are pretty common in California as well. There is a separate subspecies that goes further north. Um, and these are the ones that you'll find in the willow trees. Um, and if you don't know what a willow tree is, willow trees are usually by water. Um, and so if there's a stream and you have a, a really uh, bushy tree, um, it's probably a willow tree. And if you just look inside or you listen, um, there's probably a pretty good chance that you're gonna have a red-breasted sapsucker in there. So we'll just take one second to listen to their song. Red-breasted sapsucker. So once again, a little bit different um, and something that's probably a little bit more identifiable uh, if you're out in the field and you're listening for these birds. Red breast. All right. 
Um, and then the final is the red naped sapsucker. Um, and um, this guy is beautiful. It has the red on the nape of uh, the, the neck um, on top of the head as well. Um, and a lot of times these, these birds in particular um, will share their previous year's ho uh, homes or their, their nest holes uh, with things like mountain bluebird, nuthatches, chickadees, mountain chickadees. We see them all over the place as well. Um, and um, so keep your eye out and keep your eye out to make sure um, that you're not seeing the red breasted versus the red nate um, because they are different. All right, I know we're short on time, so we'll kind of wrap it up here with our Northern Flicker. Um, and we call this one the red shafted. So if you look at the, the color of the feathers on its tail, and if you can just see under that wing there uh, on the right hand side, um, it has uh, an orangey red color. Um, and there is a separate subspecies that is a yellow shafted flicker. Um, we do on occasion get a yellow shafted in California. They typically seem to be more desert birds. So we typically will find them kind of on the east side of 395. Um, and um, these are the birds that if you go uh, on a hike and you see something fly from the ground high up into the tree that is woodpecker size, it's probably a northern flicker. These guys like to eat on the ground. Um, and so you will see them hopping around all over the ground. Um, I know that we have them uh, in our backyard at the cabin. Uh, and you know they're they're just looking for their food on the ground. Um, they're not likely to be climbing up and down. Look at the size of that tail. It's not really meant uh, for them to be able to climb trees. Um, they they really do feed on the ground and then just kind of roost or hang out in the trees. So watch for that red shafted, that red color, or the yellow color. Uh, so there's there's both, and uh, they're both northern flickers just subspecies. Northern All right, um, well, let's do that real quick. Let's just, uh, this is gonna be a distinct Northern call. Flicker. And boy, do they have a settle on <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, That is a really familiar sound uh, for a lot of people that are doing any kind of hiking. Um, these are pretty common, um, and that sound uh, is indicative of having the flicker around. All right, I, I told Tori I just wanted to take a minute to talk about uh, if you were to want to kind of draw them into your yard. Um, so if you, if you do feed the birds, um, you can feed the woodpeckers. Um, they are particularly fond of the suet. Um, and the suet cakes, which are, you know, probably what, three or four inches by three or four inches. Um, this picture here is, um, if you look at this bird here, uh, that's on the left here, um, it is a downy woodpecker. Um, if you look at the size of the bill, um, remember it still has that black and white, but that bill is really small. Um, and um, so these, uh, these, Suet feeders um, can be in combination with a seed feeder. You can buy them on their own where it's just like a little cage that you hang from the tree. Um, I will tell you that most of the woodpeckers in our backyard um, do stop by the suet feeder uh, in order to have a little nibble. Um, and we even on occasion uh, on these uh, uh, taller feeders, uh, seed feeders, um, they will kind of come hang on the bottom. So you'll see them kind of tipping over um, and they will grab uh, some seed as well. So these are some great options. Um, if you don't have them in your backyard um, and you want to um, go get a suet feeder, uh, it's a great option. Uh, and some resources um, just uh, based on today, most of the information um, specific comes from allaboutbirds.org, um, which is part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and as Tori mentioned earlier, I am a huge fan of eBird. Um, I think it is a great tool for everybody to use and you can use it um, just sitting in your lawn chair in your backyard watching your birds at the feeder. Um, it allows uh, the researchers to really be able to tell when birds are coming through specific areas, how long they're staying, um, and when they're migrating either north or south. So 
Um, if you haven't already done it, I would encourage you to go out and set up a free eBird account. Um, and they do have apps for both Android and uh, Apple iOS. Um, and you can have it with you wherever you go and record your sightings. Um, I use iBird on my phone as a, as a uh, reference guide. Um, so if you ever need to look something up, you can uh, use an app on your phone. There is a Big Bear Birding Facebook group. Um, so if you're not part of the Big Bear Birding Facebook group, um, it's once again, a free resource. If you have a Facebook account, just search Big Bear Birding um, and uh, join the group to see what everybody's posting of what's being seen around the Big Bear Valley. Um, and we have, uh, Sandy Reamley is the moderator for the group. Um, and she and a, a number of other people post some fantastic bird pictures of what's being seen uh, in, in the Big Bear Valley itself. And of course, chirpforbirds.com. There's lots of resources out there. Um, if, you, uh, if you are just a beginner um, or you're advanced and you're looking to refine your skills, um, there's lots of great things for you out there. And with that, let's jump into some questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. All right. So like I said, we have a ton of questions. If we don't get the chance to answer them today, we can go back and we're going to answer some on Facebook and YouTube. So don't worry. Also, you can always call us if you want the answers right away. So, you know, we're here for you. We're here to answer those questions. So we have one from Naomi. She says, I would like to know if you have any favorite books for the general public to learn about birds, aside from a field guide. Great question. Yeah. Um, so to be honest, um, I would say that um, the, the field guides are probably the best place to start. Um, and the important thing, especially if you're new, is to start to classify the birds of how you see them um, when they're sitting. So do they sit upright? Are they on a tree? Um, are they wading along the shore of, the wa of water? Um, so really start to classify the birds into those different areas. Um, I will tell you my very first uh, field guide bird book that I used um, was National Geographic. Um, and they were honestly the leader for a lot of years. Um, and they classify their birds together so that um, you have the ability to be able to narrow down what you're looking for. Um, and if you're a photographer and you like to take pictures but you don't know what the birds are, um, Cornell, uh, there's a Merlin app out there available for free as well. And you simply upload your picture and it will tell you um, either what it is or what it likely could be. So there's some resources out there um, and I would probably start with those. Um, and then um, there's a lot of specific books about a lot of different areas. And I do have some books on gulls and warblers and hummingbirds. So if you have a specific interest, um, generally you could probably find a book that kind of covers that whole species of birds. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. Another question. Let's see. Um, oh, do acorn, do downy woodpeckers have more claws or toes than an acorn woodpecker? Um, no, um, they're, they're generally the same. Um, the, uh, the downy is half the size of an acorn though. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there is a, a significant size difference between the two. Yeah. And then this is a question about the Lewis Lewis is woodpecker. Uh, are the females pretty like the males? Yes, they are. Uh, those I love. Those. I've never seen those birds before. So you showed me today. Beautiful. Oh, Beautiful. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Like I said, we can continue to answer your questions. You can call us in, email us at help at, help at tripforbirds.com. Um, but I just wanted to share with you guys, as Matthew had mentioned, Woodpeckers are attracted to suet. So if you guys stick around for a little bit, I'll let you know how you can potentially win some suet for your backyard birds. But first I want to say thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us here today. It's always such a pleasure to get to work with you. I really, really enjoy just, you know, learning about the birds from you. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I will see everybody on the, the next in-person bird walk if you're going to join Chirp uh, on July 3rd. I'll be there. So yes, uh, Ooh, come meet Matthew. <laughs> All right, All right thanks, sorry. Thank you so much, Matthew. So now it is your turn to test your birding 
brain, you can go to chirpforbirds.com slash quiz to take a super quick, easy quiz all about those wacky woodpeckers. And you'll be entered into win a suet starter kit. So you know how Matthew mentioned how much woodpeckers love suet? Well, in this kit, you'll be receiving three suet cakes as well as the classic suet cage feeder. So you'll be all set to feed your backyard woodpeckers. <laughs> and just for joining us today, Chirp wants to say thank you for all those who take the quiz. We're gonna be mailing you a one of a kind Chirp sign sticker. See, there it is. So cool. And the reason we're doing this sticker is because Chirp is actually moving to a new location. So we're moving about half a mile away. We're still going to be in Big Bear Lakes West Village. And you can come visit us starting June 30th to check out our upgraded feeder forest, our larger location, and just pop by and say hi. Oh, and don't forget, you only have 24 hours to complete the quiz. So make sure you get on that right away. <laughs> All right. Well, until we see you again, whether it be virtually in person, I just wanna let you know of some of the upcoming events that we have for you. We have our bird walks and talks. We have our in-person bird walk. Our next one is on July 3rd, as Matthew mentioned. At 8 a.m., we're gonna meet at the new Chirp location for the address and all the information. It's gonna be 578 Bonanza Trail. You can also check out chirpforbirds.com slash events for the event details. You can also join us virtually for our virtual bird walk. That's gonna be on the 14th at five o'clock p.m. We then have our bird talk, which is actually gonna be about bats this time. Super interesting. We have a fantastic speaker. I'm really looking forward to getting to talk with her about one of these really, really unique animals. So that's gonna be on the 17th of July at 10 a.m. You can join us for those virtual events live on Facebook or on YouTube, just like you did today. <laughs> and then, if you're in the Big Bear Lake area, we would love to have you join us for the new nest ribbon cutting. That's gonna be on July 7th at 12 o'clock p.m. We're gonna have some free gifts. We're gonna have some refreshments for you guys. We just wanna celebrate our new location and encourage you to fly by our new nest. The address is right there, 578 Bonanza Trail, Big Bear Lake, California, 92315. <laughs> and until we see you again, let us know how we can help. We are located in Big Bear Lakes Village. You can email us at help at chirpforbirds.com or visit our website, chirpforbirds.com. You can also connect with us on our various social media platforms. And by following us, we guarantee you will better your bird brain because we post fun facts about birding and we keep you up to date on all of our upcoming events. <laughs> so thank you again for watching. We have really enjoyed getting to teach you about woodpeckers, learn about nature together, and just continue to connect with wild birds and each other. So thank you so much. Go ahead and don't forget to take that quiz, chirpforbirds.com slash quiz. And for wild bird supplies, guides, and gifts, you can check out chirpforbirds.com. Until next time, happy birding. <laughs>